Thank you very much, Dr. Moi. Thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you very much for having me and, 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 and greetings to everybody who's listening to this and hopefully those in Pakistan who are listening to this if we don't get cut off in terms of the internet. I think that when it comes to the issues that are unfolding in Pakistan, I think that the first thing to highlight is that it's a matter that's not restricted to Pakistan itself. The reality is that what's happening in Pakistan is affecting events way beyond its borders. And the reason why I say that is that while many try to focus specifically on what happened inside Pakistan, which we'll get to a bit later, the reality is that the ramifications were felt beyond Pakistan. And I think the greatest evidence of that was the way in which we saw countries outside Pakistan celebrate the downfall of Imran Khan for a number of reasons. <clears throat> the first is that Imran Khan, with his presence and with his policies and indeed primarily with his rhetoric as well, was transforming the image of Pakistan from a state which was supposed to be a proxy of some of the other Muslim states, from a state which was supposed to be a follower, a state that was supposed to be a sidekick or reinforcement, to a state that was now dictating the debate and policy and general trends that were taking place in the Muslim world and beyond. You'll remember, for example, Imran Khan's speech at the United Nations which while many tried to suggest that it was only a matter of words, the reality is that those words deeply resonated with a Muslim ummah that was thirsty for a representative that could eloquently convey its views on the international stage in a way that did not necessarily make the Muslims look as if they were essentially paranoid or angry people, but in a way that presented them as very objective, logical thinkers that had legitimate grievances with the way in which many in the Western world approached issues. We saw that Imran Khan, for example, had navigated Pakistan from being considered part of one particular orbit of politics, whether that's in the Muslim world or indeed in the wider world, to one in which Pakistan became a much more independent thinker, independent operator, positioning itself as part of a wider community within which it was able to position itself as a key driver. By that I reference, in particular, we saw the issue of the Kuala Lumpur summit which upset some in the Middle East in particular, that Imran Khan would dare to try to renegotiate the relationship between Pakistan and certain Middle East states from a relationship of dependency to a relationship of equal self-respect. The reason why I start with that is to highlight why somebody who is not Pakistani and outside Pakistan is showing a very great interest in what's happening inside Pakistan. Because the outcome or the conclusion of what happens inside Pakistan to the fate of Imran Khan in particular will affect the trends that we see in the Muslim world and beyond. I think that the easiest way for those of us outside Pakistan to understand what's happening to Imran Khan is to put ourselves in the shoes of the establishment itself that has tried to imprison Imran Khan. And I will do something audacious. Let's try to put myself in the position of the establishment. And that's perhaps the best way, I think, to explain what has happened to Imran Khan. An establishment has been in power and entrenched itself for many years, perhaps even decades. And it has a certain way of governing Pakistan or the like. So Imran Khan comes to power. Imran Khan starts to speak a bit too loudly about issues relating to Palestine and Kashmir. And that is affecting our relationship with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which are trying to pursue warmer ties with India and trying to pursue warmer ties with the Israelis. And there is clear agitation that in every OIC summit, Imran Khan insists on speaking on the Muslim issues that matter, keeps repeating Kashmir, Palestine, Kashmir, Palestine, and these states are saying to Imran Khan, you need to tone it down because when you talk about Kashmir, you're affecting our relations with India. And when you are talking about Palestine, we're trying to normalize with the Israelis. You need to stop talking about these issues of justice. You need to learn to be quiet and to follow the trend, not to be somebody who sets the debate. You are putting us in an uncomfortable position in public opinion. But Imran Khan refused to do so. Imran Khan continued to shout from the hilltops that we need to talk about these issues because they are the issues that matter. The establishment finds itself in a position whereby where it prefers a relationship of dependency, 
Imran Khan is now arguing for a relationship of equal respect and that is causing a shift in that the people are resonating with Imran Khan. Those who never took an interest in Pakistan are now resonating with Imran Khan. Those who never thought Pakistan could be a leader in the Muslim world are now looking at Pakistan in terms of raising the issues that matter that the rest of the Muslim world are sort of setting aside and that's causing issues for the establishment in that they find themselves increasingly incapable of pushing back against Imran Khan because he's enjoying this external popularity. Imran Khan is aware that he's becoming more popular as he's raising this language and the like. And when the Americans come along and insist that Pakistan, they ask for a, for a, for a demonstration of loyalty by allowing Pakistan to use its military bases for US operations in the region. Imran Khan turns around and says, we will not allow the US to use the military bases in Pakistan to conduct those operations. We see that Imran Khan, not only does he refuse them, no, Imran Khan is said, instead states that Pakistan should be expanding and diversifying its relations as a necessity to preserve Pakistan's independence. The establishment becomes increasingly concerned that Imran Khan is going from somebody of a man of rhetoric to a statesman who is actually trying to pursue or navigate rough waters to try to guide Pakistan towards a position in which it is able to assert its interest in a manner that doesn't leave it dependent on those who prefer it to be secondary in the relationship. So when Imran Khan finally uses, or not finally, but begins to use his democratic powers to begin to assert himself as the legitimate prime minister of the state, we see this backlash from the establishment that is so outraged that a democratically elected leader would actually use his powers for the sake of Pakistan instead of following orders. They are so horrified by the notion that the people can decide a leader. They are so horrified the idea that a democratic election can produce a leader who would actually use those democratic powers in a way in which he leverages the people for the sake of what he's trying to achieve that they decide to orchestrate this vote of no confidence to topple Imran Khan to say that, listen, in this country, it's not the people who decide. In this country, it's not the people who choose. We choose for the people. We don't allow the masses to choose. And so Imran Khan, who was trying to lean on the people in order to push back and in order to establish himself, found himself ousted in a vote of no confidence, assisted by political parties that were upset that the people preferred Imran Khan over them. Political parties that should have stood with Imran Imran Khan and acknowledged that there should be respect for the democratic mandate that saw what was happening to Imran Khan and knew that Imran Khan was being targeted for no other reason than that he was using his democratic powers as a democratically elected leader should be. The parties, instead of saying we should stand by on principle with Imran Khan, turned around and got very hungry and said, this is our opportunity to finally support this removal of a popular leader so that we are the only choices to the people and they won't necessarily choose the person that they want, something that will be a dark stain on every political party that voted with the vote of no confidence to topple Imran Khan when they knew why he was being voted out. The issue, however, for the establishment is that the people refused to be quiet. Instead of the Imran Khan quietly going back home, we saw the Pakistanis take to the streets and challenge the establishment. We saw thousands take to the streets. We saw tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands, taking to the streets, demanding that Imran Khan be respected as the democratically elected leader. And for the establishment, this posed a crisis, primarily because with all these people on the streets and these people refusing to go home, it makes it very difficult to orchestrate a political scenario in which you can argue that Imran Khan was somebody who should have been thrown out. And that's why we saw arguably the most clumsy a series of events that took place to try to uh, remove Imran Khan's popularity. We saw more than 175 charges levied at Imran Khan, which would later become 200 plus. And essentially the establishment threw anything at Imran Khan, hoping something would stick. There were charges of terrorism, charges of corruption, charges of tweeting, charges of Facebook, charges of insulting a judge, uh, charges of taking a gift and not declaring it, anything that they could find in the book in terms of trying to make it stick with Imran Khan, they threw it not in the belief that he was actually guilty of any of it, but in the hope that perhaps any of it will stick whereby they might be able to cast doubt on somebody whose image in the Pakistani mentality and indeed be ab abroad beyond Pakistani's border was seen as somebody who even if perhaps he did not have the power 
power everybody wished he had was certainly seen as sincere and honest and being targeted by insincere individuals who were concerned at the potential that Imran Khan was going to achieve for Pakistan. And on this particular point, it's important to emphasize the potential that Imran Khan might have achieved for Pakistan. And the reason why I say that is because it's important to note that in those three years of Imran Khan, Pakistan's image abroad transformed exponentially. When Saudi Arabia and the UAE threatened Imran Khan and told him, if you go to the Kuala Lumpur summit, we will kick out the Pakistanis from Saudi Arabia and send them back. We will withdraw our investments from Pakistan. The reason they panicked so much is because Imran Khan had gathered such popularity in the Muslim world that they felt that Imran Khan lending legitimacy to the Kuala Lumpur summit, which was a protest against the normalization policies of Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the like, and a protest by the Muslim world that the de-Islamization policies taking place. They felt that Imran Khan had achieved such a status in the Muslim world that if he lent legitimacy to the Kuala Lumpur summit, it would be a body blow to these countries and result in a shift in the Muslim world. Many people want to insist that Imran Khan was just a man of rhetoric. If he was, then these nations would not have threatened Pakistan. If he was only rhetoric, these nations would not have mobilized to threaten Pakistan. If he was only a man of rhetoric, the US would not have told the establishment that we will forgive if you if you remove Imran Khan. The reality is that while many people believe perhaps Imran Khan might not have achieved enough, it was absolutely clear to those who wanted Pakistan to be a dependent country, to be a second class country, to be a follower, not a leader. It was clear Imran Khan was renegotiating Pakistan's position in the world as a leading figure and therefore there was a necessity to remove Imran Khan before he could reach that particular point. And that's why when it came to the establishment and and they realized that there was a potential revolutionary renegotiation of the social contract that Imran Khan was going to bring about even after he was toppled with the vote of no confidence. This is why there was a necessity, and I'm speaking as if I'm in the position of the establishment, there was a necessity to remove Imran Khan because the Pakistani people wanted him. There was a necessity to remove Imran Khan but because he was somebody supported by the people and Pakistan is not supposed to be supported by the people. I and that's why when it comes to the establishment, we saw the clumsiness in that even when the, there was a call for elections, they refused to do so. So even when PTI won a landslide in Punjab, they were winning those elections still, something that made the establishment panic so much that when the PTI tried to force general elections by dissolving the Punjab assembly, the, the electoral commission not only refused to host general elections, they put in a chief commissioner of their own. And when the Supreme Court said that elections should be held, the establishment quite simply ignored the Supreme Court itself. Essentially, you, now what we're seeing is, and I'm I will wrap up on, on this particular point because I know my, my window is only 10 minutes. But, but the point is now what we're seeing from the establishment is to try to find a way to politically engineer a result that means that Imran Khan and PTI are not on the ballot box. It's about trying to orchestrate an election that can be recognized internationally and domestically, an election in which Imran Khan is not on the ballot box. It's about trying to ensure that the Pakistani people do not have an avenue to express themselves. It's about trying to ensure elections where the Pakistani people are not the ones who choose, but rather the establishment provides a series of choices between quotation marks that the Pakistani people will not necessarily be interested in, but that preserves a status quo, which means that it's not the people who dictate the fate of Pakistan. It's a select group of elites who tell the Pakistani people what is good for them. And that's why when it comes to Pakistan, and this is where I finish on this point, when people ask, why why does it matter? Why is everybody interested? Why is everybody focused on Imran Khan in a way that they were never focused on Pakistan before? It's because if the establishment successfully managed to orchestrate elections and results where there is no PTI or Imran Khan, then it would essentially be a victory of an establishment over the popular will. It will be an issue where the Pakistani people have been subjugated by a minority that was terrified that the Pakistani people would actually experience express their desire for self-determination and free will. This is a battle battle for the future of Pakistan and the identity of Pakistan. And in particular, it's a battle to decide who was Pakistan built for? Was it built for an elite question. to control the majority or was it built for the Pakistani people? If you can hear me, Sami, I just, I think you couldn't hear me earlier. 
I just have a quick question before you wind up. So do you see the removal of Imran Khan, because you're also an expert on the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa. Do you see serious similarities between Imran Khan's removal and Mohammed Mursi's removal in, in 2013 uh, when he was seen maybe by the Islamist, by the Israelis, but he was seen as an anti-dynastic republicanism uh, in an area dominated by the dynasties in Saudi Arabia, the Arab kingdoms? Very quick. I think that there are many similarities, but I actually think Imran Khan is in a better position than Mursi was in Egypt. Mursi was seen as somebody that was so terrifying to Saudi Arabia and the UAE because he represented this idea of a president chosen by popular will in a region where the popular will is repressed and in a region in which the popular will is not allowed to manifest itself. But by the time Mursi was toppled, the media had successfully managed to create this polarization whereby there was either extreme love or extreme hate of Mursi and that resulted in an in ability to engage more people on the streets that might have rescued Morsi. Imran Khan case is different in that the media has not been successful in undermining that popularity. Instead, he's more popular than he's ever been before. And that's why the establishment keep fumbling over themselves in terms of when these election dates should be held because they're terrified that it, trying to rig an election is not an easy process, especially when millions and millions of Pakistanis still believe in Imran Khan and want to vote for him. And rigging elections, they want to wait for a period whereby Pakistanis get tired, whereby they go home, whereby they're no longer interested. And now we're January and Pakistanis are still interested. They still know what's happening. And that's why the establishment is shaking and saying, when will we get to a period where Pakistan Pakistanis will just forget so that they won't riot when they see the politically engineered result in the elections. Imran Khan is different from Mursi in that more Pakistani people are still standing by Imran Khan. And that's why the establishment is still tripping over itself to find a way to launch elections that won't provoke riots in Pakistan. They've announced February, but it may not even happen in February because at this moment in time, Imran Khan is still the main story, even as they try to prevent any mention of Imran Khan in the public sphere.